The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 12. Ghek Plays Pranks. While Tara of Helium was being led to the towers of Jetan, Ghek was escorted to the pits beneath the palace where he was imprisoned in a dimly lighted chamber. Here he found a bench and a table standing upon the dirt floor near the wall, and set in the wall several rings from which depended short lengths of chain. At the base of the walls were several holes in the dirt floor. These alone of the several things he saw interested him. Ghek sat down upon the bench and waited in silence, listening. Presently the lights were extinguished. If Ghek could have smiled, he would have then, for Ghek could see as well in the dark as in the light. Better, perhaps. He watched the dark openings of the holes in the floor and waited. Presently he detected a change in the air about him. It grew heavy with a strange odor and once again might Ghek have smiled, could he have smiled. Let them replace all the air in the chamber with their most deadly fumes. It would be all the same to Ghek, the Kaldane, who, having no lungs, required no air. With the Rykor it might be different. Deprived of air it would die, but if only a sufficient amount of the gas were introduced to stupefy an ordinary creature it would have no effect upon the Rykor who had no objective mind to overcome. So long as the excess of carbon dioxide in the blood was not sufficient to prevent heart action, the Rykor would suffer only a diminution of vitality, but would still respond to the exciting agency of the Kaldane's brain. Ghek caused the Rykor to assume a sitting position, with its back against the wall, where it might remain without direction from his brain. Then he released his contact with its spinal cord, but remained in position upon its shoulders, waiting and watching, for the Kaldane's curiosity was aroused. He had not long to wait before the lights were flashed on and one of the locked doors opened to admit a half-dozen warriors. They approached him rapidly and worked quickly. First they removed all his weapons, and then, snapping a fetter about one of the Rykor's ankles, secured him to the end of one of the chains hanging from the walls. Next they dragged the long table to a new position and there bolted it to the floor so that an end, instead of the middle, was directly before the prisoner. On the table before him they set food and water, and upon the opposite end of the table they laid the key to the fetter. Then they unlocked and opened all the doors and departed. When Turan the Panthon regained consciousness it was to the realization of a sharp pain in one of his forearms. The effects of the gas departed as rapidly as they had overcome him, so that as he opened his eyes he was in full possession of all his faculties. The lights were on again, and in their glow there was revealed to the man the figure of a giant Martian rat crouching upon the table and gnawing upon his arm. Snatching his arm away he reached for his short sword, while the rat, growling, sought to seize his arm again. It was then that Turan discovered that his weapons had been removed, short sword, long sword, dagger, and pistol. The rat charged him then, and striking the creature away with his hand the man rose and backed off, searching for something with which to strike a harder blow. Again the rat charged, and as Turan stepped quickly back to avoid the menacing jaws something seemed to jerk suddenly upon his right ankle and as he drew his left foot back to regain his equilibrium his heel caught upon a taut chain, and he fell heavily backward to the floor, just as the rat leaped upon his breast and sought his throat. The Martian rat is a fierce and unlovely thing. It is many-legged and hairless, its hide resembling that of a newborn mouse in repulsiveness. In size and weight it is comparable to a large Airedale terrier. Its eyes are small, and close-set, and almost hidden in deep, fleshy apertures, but its most ferocious and repulsive feature is its jaws, 
the entire bony structure of which protrudes several inches beyond the flesh, revealing five sharp, spade-like teeth in the upper jaw, and the same number of similar teeth in the lower, the whole suggesting the appearance of a rotting face from which much of the flesh has sloughed away. It was such a thing that it leaped upon the breast of the panthon to tear at his jugular. Twice Turan struck it away as he sought to regain his feet, but both times it returned with increased ferocity to renew its attack. Its only weapons are its jaws, since its broad splay feet are armed with blunt talons. With its protruding jaws it excavates its winding burrows, and with its broad feet it pushes the dirt behind it. To keep the jaws from his flesh, then, was Turan's only concern, and this he succeeded in doing until chance gave him a hold upon the creature's throat. After that the end was but a matter of moments. Rising at last, he flung the lifeless thing from him with a shudder of disgust. Now he turned his attention to a hurried inventory of the new conditions which surrounded him since the moment of his incarceration. He realized vaguely what had happened. He had been anesthetized and stripped of his weapons, and as he rose to his feet he saw that one ankle was fettered to a chain in the wall. He looked about the room. All the doors swung wide open. His captors would render his imprisonment the more cruel by leaving ever before him tempting glimpses of open aisles to the freedom he could not attain. Upon the end of the table, and within easy reach, was food and drink. This at least was attainable, and at sight of it his starved stomach seemed almost to cry aloud for sustenance. It was with difficulty that he ate and drank in moderation. As he devoured the food his eyes wandered about the confines of his prison, until suddenly they seized upon a thing that lay on the table at the end farthest from him. It was a key. He raised his fettered ankle and examined the lock. There could be no doubt of it. The key that lay there on the table before him was the key to that very lock. A careless warrior had laid it there and departed, forgetting. Hope surged high in the breast of Gahan of Gathol, of Turan the Panthon. Furtively, his eyes sought the open doorways. There was no one in sight. Ah, if he could but gain his freedom, he would find some way from this odious city back to her side and never again would he leave her until he had won safety for her or death for himself. He rose and moved cautiously toward the opposite end of the table where lay the coveted key. The fettered ankle halted his first step, but he stretched at full length along the table, extending eager fingers toward the prize. They almost laid hold upon it, a little more and they would touch it. He strained and stretched, but still the thing lay just beyond his reach. He hurled himself forward until the iron fetter bit deep into his flesh, but all futilely. He sat back upon the bench then, and glared at the open doors and the key, realizing now that they were part of a well-laid scheme of refined torture, none the less demoralizing because it inflicted no physical suffering. For just a moment the man gave way to useless regret and foreboding. Then he gathered himself together, his brows cleared, and he returned to his unfinished meal. At least they should not have the satisfaction of knowing how sorely they had hit him. As he ate it occurred to him that by dragging the table along the floor he could bring the key within his reach. But when he essayed to do so he found that the table had been securely bolted to the floor during the period of his unconsciousness. Again Gahan smiled and shrugged and resumed his eating. When the warriors had departed from the prison in which Ghek was confined, the Kaldane crawled from the shoulders of the Rykor to the table. Here he drank a little water and then directed the hands of the Rykor to the balance of it and to the food, upon which the brainless thing fell with avidity. While it was thus engaged, Ghek took his spider-like way along the table to the opposite end where lay the key to the fetter. Seizing it in his kila, he leaped to the floor and scurried rapidly toward the mouth of one of the burrows against the wall, into which he disappeared. For long had the brain been contemplating these burrow entrances. They appealed to his caldonine tastes, and further 
they pointed a hiding place for the key and a lair for the only kind of food that the Kaldane relished, flesh and blood. Ghek had never seen an ulcio, since these great Martian rats had long ago disappeared from Bantum, their flesh and blood having been greatly relished by the Kaldanes, but Ghek had inherited, almost unimpaired, every memory of every ancestor, and so he knew that Ulcio inhabited these lairs and that Ulcio were good to eat, and he knew what Ulcio looked like and what his habits were, though he had never seen him nor any picture of him. As we breed animals for the transmission of physical attributes, so the Kaldanes breed themselves for the transmission of attributes of the mind, including memory and the power of recollection, and thus have they raised what we term instinct above the level of the threshold of the objective mind, where it may be commanded and utilized by recollection. Doubtless in our own subjective minds lie many of the impressions and experiences of our forebears. These may impinge upon our consciousness in dreams only, or in vague, haunting suggestions that we have before experienced some transient phase of our present existence. Ah, if we had but the power to recall them! Before us would unfold the forgotten story of the lost eons that have preceded us. We might even walk with God in the garden of his stars, while man was still but a budding idea within his mind. Ghek descended into the burrow at a steep incline for some ten feet, when he found himself in an elaborate and delightful network of burrows, the Kaldane was elated. This, indeed, was life. He moved rapidly and fearlessly, and he went as straight to his goal as you could to the kitchen of your own home. This goal lay at a low level in a spheroidal cavity about the size of a large barrel. Here, in a nest of torn bits of silk and fur, lay six baby ulcios. When the mother returned, there were but five babies, and a great spider-like creature, which she immediately sprang to attack only to be met by powerful Keeley which seized and held her so that she could not move. Slowly they dragged her throat toward a hideous mouth, and in a little moment she was dead. Ghek might have remained in the nest for a long time, since there was ample food for many days, but he did not do so. Instead he explored the burrows. He followed them into many subterranean chambers of the city of Manator, and upward through walls to rooms above the ground. He found many ingeniously devised traps, and he found poisoned food and other signs of the constant battle that the inhabitants of Manator waged against these repulsive creatures that dwelt beneath their homes and public buildings. His exploration revealed not only the vast proportions of the network of runways that apparently traversed every portion of the city, but the great antiquity of the majority of them. Tons upon tons of dirt must have been removed, and for a long time he wondered where it had been deposited, until in following downward a tunnel of great size and length he sensed before him the thunderous rush of subterranean waters, and presently came to the bank of a great underground river, tumbling onward, no doubt, the length of a world to the buried sea of Omin. Into this torrential sewer had unthinkable generations of ulcios pushed their few handfuls of dirt in the excavating of their vast labyrinth. For only a moment did Ghek tarry by the river, for his seemingly aimless wanderings were in reality prompted by a definite purpose, and this he pursued with vigor and singleness of design. He followed such runways as appeared to terminate in the pits or other chambers of the inhabitants of the city, and these he explored, usually from the safety of a burrow's mouth, until satisfied that what he sought was not there. He moved swiftly upon his spider legs and covered remarkable distances in short periods of time. His search not being rewarded with immediate success, he decided to return to the pit where his rykor lay chained and look to its wants. As he approached the end of the burrow that terminated in the pit, he slackened his pace, stopping just within the entrance of the runway that he might scan the interior of the chamber before entering it. As he did so, he saw the figure of a warrior appear suddenly in an opposite doorway. The rykor sprawled upon the table, his hands groping blindly for more food. 
Ghek saw the warrior pause and gaze in sudden astonishment at the rykor. He saw the fellow's eyes go wide and an ashen hue replace the copper bronze of his cheek. He stepped back as though someone had struck him in the face. For an instant only he stood thus, as in a paralysis of fear. Then he uttered a smothered shriek and turned and fled. Again was it a catastrophe that Ghek the Kaldane could not smile? Quickly entering the room he crawled to the tabletop and affixed himself to the shoulders of his rykor, and there he waited. And who may say that Ghek, though he could not smile, possessed not a sense of humor? For a half hour he sat there, and then there came to him the sound of men approaching along corridors of stone. He could hear their arms clank against the rocky walls, and he knew that they came at a rapid pace, but just before they reached the entrance to his prison they paused and advanced more slowly. In the lead was an officer, and just behind him, wide-eyed and perhaps still a little ashen, the warrior who had so recently departed in haste. At the doorway they halted, and the officer turned sternly upon the warrior. With upraised finger he pointed at Ghek. There sits the creature. Didst thou dare lie then to thy dwar? I swear, cried the warrior, that I spoke the truth. But a moment since the thing groveled, headless, upon this very table. And may my first ancestor strike me dead upon the spot if I speak other than a true word. The officer looked puzzled. The men of Mars seldom, if ever, lie. He scratched his head. Then he addressed Ghek. How long have you been here? he asked. Who knows better than those who placed me here and chained me to a wall? he returned in reply. Saw you this warrior enter here a few minutes since? I saw him, replied Ghek. And you sat there where you sit now? continued the officer. Look thou to my chain, and tell me then where else I might sit, cried Ghek. Art the people of thy city all fools? Three other warriors pressed behind the two in front, craning their necks to view the prisoner while they grinned at the discomfiture of their fellow. The officer scowled at Ghek. Thy tongue is as venomous as that of the Shebanth Otar sent to the towers of Jitan, he said. You speak of the young woman who was captured with me, asked Ghek, his expressionless monotone and face revealing naught of the interest he felt. I speak of her, replied the Dwar, and then turning to the warrior who had summoned him, return to thy quarters, and remain there until the next games. Perhaps by that time thy eyes may have learned not to deceive thee. The fellow cast a venomous glance at Ghek and turned away. The officer shook his head. I do not understand it, he muttered. Always has Uvan been a true and dependable warrior. Could it be, he glanced piercingly at Ghek, Thou hast a strange head that misfits thy body, fellow, he cried. Our legends tell us of those ancient creatures that placed hallucinations upon the mind of their fellows. If thou be such, then, maybe Uvan suffered from thy forbidden powers. If thou be such, Otar will know well how to deal with thee. He wheeled about and motioned his warriors to follow him. Wait, cried Ghek, unless I am to be starved, send me food. You have had food, replied the warrior. Am I to be fed but once a day, asked Ghek? I require food oftener than that. Send me food. You shall have food, replied the officer. None may say that the prisoners of Manator are ill-fed, just are the laws of Manator, and he departed. No sooner had the sounds of their passing died away in the distance than Ghek clambered from the shoulders of his rykor and scurried to the burrow where he had hidden the key. Fetching it, he unlocked the fetter from about the creature's ankle, locked it empty, and carried the key farther down into the burrow. Then he returned to his place upon the brainless servitor. After a while he heard footsteps approaching, whereupon he rose and passed into another corridor from that down which he knew the warrior was coming. Here he waited out of sight, listening. He heard the man enter the chamber and halt he heard a muttered exclamation, followed by the jangle of metal dishes as a salver was slammed upon the table. Then rapidly retreating footsteps, 
which quickly died away in the distance. Ghek lost no time in returning to the chamber, recovering the key, relocking the rykor to his chain. Then he replaced the key in the burrow, and squatting on the table beside his headless body, directed its hands toward the food. While the rykor ate, Ghek sat listening for the scraping sandals and clattering arms that he knew soon would come. Nor had he long to wait. Ghek scrambled to the shoulders of his rykor as he heard them coming. Again it was the officer who had been summoned by Uvan, and with him were three warriors. The one directly behind him was evidently the same who had brought the food, for his eyes went wide when he saw Ghek sitting at the table and he looked very foolish as the dwar turned his stern glance upon him. "'It is even as I said,' he cried. "'He was not here when I brought his food.' "'But he is here now,' said the officer grimly, "'and his fetter is locked about his ankle. Look, it has not been opened, but where is the key? It should be upon the table at the end opposite him. Where is the key, creature?' he shouted at Ghek. "'How should I, a prisoner?' no better than my jailer the whereabouts of the key to my fetters he retorted but it lay here cried the officer pointing to the other end of the table did you see it asked ghek the officer hesitated no but it must have been there he parried did you see the key lying there asked ghek pointing to another warrior the fellow shook his head negatively and you and you continued the kaldane addressing the others they both admitted that they never had seen the key, and if it had been there, how could I have reached it, he continued. No, he could not have reached it, admitted the officer, but there shall be no more of this. Isaac, you will remain here on guard with this prisoner until you are relieved. Isaac looked anything but happy as this intelligence was transmitted to him, and he eyed Ghek suspiciously as the dwar and the other warriors turned and left him to his unhappy lot. This is the end of The Chessmen and Mars, Chapter 12, Recording by Tom Weiss.